Well, good morning, friends, and happy Easter. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Cole, and I'm one of the pastors at Central, and you can probably tell we are not at Central. Um, and so I uh, would love to invite you to come uh, see us again, if you haven't already, uh, to Sunday morning. Next week, we have, a, um, we have services at uh, 8.30 and 11.15. If you want to get extra Easterly today, we got two more services at the uh, at the church. If you want to do that at nine and ten forty-five, but uh, we're glad uh, you're here uh, at Central. We seek the transformation of our lives, our communities, and the world through the renewing work of Jesus Christ. And what a wonderful day to celebrate that reality when we talk about the resurrection that transforms our lives. It changes us. And so I'm happy to be with you this morning. Uh, I, I want to start with a, a question. Uh, my question is, have you ever witnessed something startling or surprising or something that you, have, you never would have thought it would happen? It's just like it was just blows your mind that it would happen. Uh, I, as I was thinking about that question this week, a, a funny one came up, and it's, about, uh, it's when I played football. And don't worry, it's not a brag. I was not a very good football player. Um, it's, it wasn't good. Uh, I was a lineman, though. Um, and uh, I don't know if you know that the whole point of being a lineman is just to push people around for a while. That's kind of what we do. Um, and, uh, but in my heart of hearts, and I think actually every lineman's heart, so this could be a support group for linemen everywhere. Um, in our heart, we wanted to be a running back or a wide receiver, or somebody who got the ball and scored a touchdown and got the glory. But the problem was I was a little bigger than your average running back or quarterback, and I was super slow. Um, <laughs> didn't really work out. So, But all that changed in one surprising moment during a game. We're running a play that had me blocking as usual, uh, and, and I'm pushing this guy, and this guy, the guy in front of me just murders me he just beats me really fast and he's and he's straight to the running back and he hits the running back so clearly I wasn't doing my job super well um, and the guy hits our running back and the ball shoots in the air and it lands directly into my hands and if I could I could never have planned that like if I would have planned it I would have dropped it or just handed it to the other guy like I, maybe this is yours I, I, it's not mine um, but it's but I had it and so I ran I, I ran as, as fast as I could, and I was thinking, man, I, I see the end zone. I see it there. I was like, maybe I'm, I, I think I've run 20, 30 yards. I think this is it. I might get there. In reality, I ran about three or four yards and actually tripped over my own feet and the guy on the ground, um, so it didn't really work out. I just remember, I just remember laying there being like, what in the world just happened? Why am I doing this? Why am I here? Well, we all have experience some bit of shocking or surprising thing, whether it be goofy or funny or something that wasn't funny at the time and now you can laugh about later. Um, we also, many of us, have experienced surprising moments that create fear and worry or they are deeply painful and leaving us stunned, even if there was no, oftentimes with resolution, not even what we wanted. So since last Sunday, we have been recounting this true story of Jesus. From Palm Sunday, where he enters in as our humble king to his brutal murder on Good Friday. And this morning, we proclaim that that horrific death that Jesus had on the cross was not the end. That there is much more to the story. And the women at the tomb would be the ones to tell it to us and to experience it firsthand and then to the disciples, and then to the ends of the earth, and to us this morning. I don't know if you know this, and is, is the in, we are the ends of the earth. Like the gospel has went forth, and we have it here. It didn't start in America, right? Like it, it came to us, and we, we are here today because of faithful men and women who shared the gospel. And all of this started with a group of grieving friends and followers, a group of women with arms full of cloth and burial spices, a very sensory reminder of the grim reality that their friend is no longer with them and they by his side. All this after spending what had to have, I imagine, a, a horrible, long 
day of questioning and lament and even fear on that Saturday, on that Sabbath. This is the state of those who encounter this surprising interaction with an angel. And which, honestly, if we're honest too, but the fact that, you know, the precious moments, angels, um, I don't really, I'm never really afraid of them. Um, but man, in scripture, every time you meet an angel, you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa no, um, like, please. And every time he says, like, just don't be afraid. Um, not happening with precious moments. But this angel comes in and he says, he's not here. Uh, he is risen. And they go and they see this empty tomb and they're charged to go tell the disciples. So, friends, would you pray with me as we uh, go further? Almighty God, Lord, make clear to us this morning of the power and hope found in the resurrection of your Son, that we might be changed, that we would see the world as we ought to, that we would love generously because we are deeply loved by you. So, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be holy and pleasing to you our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, verses six through eight, which we've read already, but I'll read again, says, he is not here. This is the angel speaking to the women. He is not here for he has risen as he said he would. Come see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee and there you will see him. See, I have told you, and so they departed quickly from the tomb with awe and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. They left with fear and great joy or awe and great joy. Or today we'll think of it as they left in wonder and joy. One of the themes in the gospel of Matthew is one of seeing. Jesus in his teaching is helping or challenging us to see the world as it really is. Uh, with a lens of what it ought to be and what eventually will be. The resurrection is no different. It gives us a lens to see the world and how we're to live in light of it. And the startling truth of the resurrection brings a sense of wonder and a sustaining joy in a disillusioned world. So why wonder? Well, we see in the text a group of women coming to a tomb, somber, grieving, and concerned. Things seem to be all but finished. There seems to be no way out. The promises Jesus had given, the hopes of their people seem to be dashed. Rome is still in power. Corruption still reigns. And those who were supposed to be uh, helping them, who leading them, actually conspired against them and to murder their friend. One writer, in speaking of how the Marys interacted with this, says this, the two Marys had approached the tomb with, a deep, with deep mourning for a dead friend and teacher. And they returned full of awe and with an indestructible joy to tell others about Jesus who had both risen from the grave and greeted them. See, we live in a world that yearns for wonder, but it's often far more disillusioned than that. Where we dream big dreams and yet are confronted with things that would counteract, challenge, or break our way of seeing those ideas come to completion often assuming that wonder is just a childish endeavor rather than a way to see the world. And over time, it just makes us cynical, disillusioned, disenchanted. We say phrases like, it is what it is, right? And things will always be this way and things will never change. In the face of trauma and fear and worry, these statements seem more true than ever. Hope or imagining something different just seems too risky and too painful. So we settle for our now, assuming that's all there is. And I wish I could say that those who follow Jesus do differently, but we struggle too. We sometimes have a lack of imagination for what God might do in this world, to people's lives and even our own. We forget the plot. We forget the changing power of the resurrection. We too often, more often than not, trade trust, faith, hope, and love for expediency, security, comfortability, and power. Stanley Hauerwas says this about um, this security that we find. He says, they leave the tomb in awe, knowing that they are now participants in the kingdom of God. The fear that they have as they leave the tomb is the fear that protects them from the fears that would have us deny the resurrection. 
and the fear and joy that possesses their life saves them from fears derived from the attempt to create lives of security in the face of death. See, the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. The breaking forth of the kingdom of God and its values calls to question the disillusionment of our days and proclaims that it will not always be this way. That the kingdom of God is here and it is begun and nothing will ever be the same again. You will never be the same again. The, the great enemy of death is no longer our captor. That we are free to believe, as Paul tells us in Ephesians, that God can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that was work, at work within us. Tom Wright speaks of that in this way, saying, the God who remained apparently silent on Good Friday is having the last word. He is answering the unspoken questions of Jesus' followers and the, unspoken question, or the spoken question of Jesus himself on the cross. And what God is doing is not just an extraordinary miracle or a display of supernatural power for its own sake or even a special favor to Jesus. What God is doing is starting something new, beginning the new world he promised <clears throat> long ago, sending the disciples to Galilee in the first place, but then as we will see to the ends of the earth, in the close of the age, with the news of what has happened, a whole new world was opening up in front of them. Friends, because of the resurrection, we are free to see people, places, and things as they could be and as they will be. Free to imagine a better world and to see, that at, that see it in the eyes of the kingdom of, of God. Not falling for the lies of expediency or compromise or even the fear of our neighbor. But we live a life lived out of robust love of, of God and his love towards us and a robust love of our neighbors. And because of the resurrection, we are free to do this work of wonder or imagination filled with a sustaining joy that keeps us through it all. And I mean it all. The good times and the bad times. I, I wish I could stand up here and promise you that a life following Jesus doesn't have suffering um, and, but there are some here who, among us who would attest uh, that suffering is a, is a reality. And yet they are all sort of the same people that say that their Savior has not forsaken them in the midst of that suffering. Rebecca McLaughlin, who is, a, there's a book actually out front that you can take, feel free to take it. It's a, it's a good little book on the resurrection. And uh, she wrote uh, this about um, the life of Jesus and our life in, in light of that. She says that life with Jesus is no sentimental Hallmark greeting card uh, that glosses over suffering. Instead, the love of Jesus enters into our most painful days and brings us through them into everlasting joy. This joy is rooted in the belief that Jesus' life, death, resurrection, because of it, we are made children of God. That this joy sustains us and reminds us that we are not alone. That because of Christ's ascension, we have the spirit dwelling within us to do his work and his will. We are given the church, a, a family to live with and do life with. We are given a savior who calls us friend. This passage ends with the women quickly leaving to go tell the disciples and other followers of Jesus that he has risen. And it just randomly just, it seems so happenstance, but it's obviously not, that just runs into Jesus, and he's just like, hey, what's up? Um, but their wonder in this moment, as they were wondering, what could, have, what could happen? What could be? What, what could happen in this world if he is risen? And then all of a sudden, their wonder turns into worship, and their joy is on a whole nother level. It says this in, in Matthew 28, and behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Notice in verse 9, Jesus' word, first word to them is greetings. And the word here used is Cairo in Greek, which is general, a general greeting or a well-wishing. It's not the word that I find interesting necessarily, but it's what, uh, what, is the, what is interesting is where the word is used in the previous moments in the passion narrative or the, the, the week of Jesus' life or this last week of Jesus' life. 
See, the word was used in Matthew 26 when Judas betrays Jesus, saying, Greetings, Rabbi. This seemingly harmless greeting used to spitefully betray a friend. Later in Matthew 27, when the soldiers were prepping him to be crucified, they began mocking Jesus and made a crown of thorns and put, one, uh, put it on his head, saying, All hail, King of the Jews. And again, a word used for pronouncement or a warm introduction was used to further humiliate the very person who came to save them. Yet that same word used to betray and to mock Jesus is the same word that he uses to announce his presence to his friends. He chooses a warm and common phrase that has previously been used to harm or for harm. And he uses it to bring assurance, comfort, and peace to his friends. And the woman fell, and the women fell to, to their feet, or to his feet, and worshiped him. And Jesus' response to them is, Do not be afraid. I'm here. One commentator says it this way, he says, Jesus has made it possible to live unafraid. The disciples are often afraid of the elites and the crowds, but Jesus has given them all they need to, be, to not be afraid. He has done so by drawing them and us into a life so compellingly true that we have no time to be afraid. Their wonder and joy was multiplied and strengthened because encountering Jesus changes everything. It changes the way we see the world and our place in it. It changes the way we see our neighbors, our work, our relationships, and ourselves. The resurrection calls us to see and imagine a world made new. In our longings, we are strengthened with joy, for we are not alone in our hope-filled waiting. Matter of fact, we are sent out to spread the good news of the gospel, both with our, with our words and with our hands and our feet, because the life death, resur and life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus has changed everything. We enter into a new reality where defeat or uh, where victory replaces defeat, where despair is replaced by joy and the decay of death with the life of eternity. So friends, whether you've been walking with Jesus for 50 years or five minutes, the truth of the resurrection is hope crashing into our days filled with uncertainty and disillusionment. And I pray that at today as we continue and, to, and today as even when we leave this place, that we would experience today in awe and wonder and joy like we did the first time we heard the story. Because it's true. And I pray that we would be filled with a great joy as we do his work in the places he puts us. If you're here this morning and you are skeptical about Jesus or you've the first time hearing about this, we're glad you're here. Um, any of the pastors or elders or really anyone around you would love to tell you more about this Jesus that has so changed our lives. So this week, friends, I pray that we would walk in awe and joy. That from this day, we would, we would be able to wonder again and to see what God can do in the midst of the, just being around people, being around the world and the places that he puts us. May that joy and that wonder make us see what God could possibly do. And may we ask him to do what maybe even we think would be too surprising. And may we walk in awe and joy together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, a morning like this, where we celebrate your son's resurrection, where hope is, we are reminded of hope again. We're reminded that you care so much for your world, you care so much for your people that you sent your son, own son to die for us. And that he rose again, and that he is seated with you. So Lord, as we go out from this place today, as we go out through the rest of our week, Lord, would you be with us, that you would remind us of this moment, uh, remind us of this wonder. And may we not fall prey to 
the, the feelings of disenchantment or, or just the disillusionment. But Lord, that we would see you at work even in the strangest of places. So give us that, we pray. Strengthen our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.